Hello and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver and I'm a scientist and this is Julie Oliver and she's a science fan. In this video we are going to be looking at zinc and what is hype and what is science. In particular we'll be looking at the latest research on using zinc to treat or prevent respiratory tract infections or RTIs as they are known as. We will also be looking at the various roles zinc plays in the human body, signs you could be deficient, and what you can do about it. Finally, we'll look at zinc and COVID. So let's go back to the science and see what it tells us. There have been a plethora of research studies looking at the effects of zinc on RTIs, especially colds and flu. Now, we couldn't possibly go through all of them in this video, but luckily we don't have to, because a group of scientists have done the hard work and published this systematic review and meta-analysis. It was published this month in BMJ Open and involved scientists from Australia, the USA and Canada. And they used both Cochrane and Prisma methodologies to undertake the review. And this is important because there is a right way and a wrong way to perform a systematic review or meta-analysis. And if you don't use the correct method, you basically end up with rubbish findings. Now, the authors looked at both prevention and treatment. So let's look at the prevention results first. This figure summarises the data on the prevention of community acquired RTIs. And by community acquired, I mean they looked at whether people acquired infections during everyday activities as opposed to deliberately trying to infect them. The figure is what is known as a forest plot and it shows the results of each study analysed as well as the overall result when the studies are combined. If a study is to the left of the vertical line, it means zinc has a benefit. And if it's to the right, it means a placebo is actually better. And this can sometimes happen if a treatment causes harm. If the result crosses a line, it means we don't know whether zinc or placebo is better. The other important thing to note is the little coloured dots off to the right. These are an assessment of the risk of bias for each study. Green dots mean a low risk of bias, red dots mean a high risk of bias, and yellow dots mean there is some concern. Now, if we look at the bottom of the figure, we can see that the diamond is to the left, which means that zinc showed a benefit in preventing community acquired RTIs. In terms of numbers, they found a 28% less risk of developing mild cold-like symptoms, which is not great, but it's better than a slap in the face for a wet fish. And for moderately severe symptoms or flu-like illnesses, there was an 87% less risk, which is pretty good. And the certainty of the evidence for both these findings was rated as moderate, which means that the actual effect is probably close to the reported effect. They also looked at some studies where people were directly inoculated with nasal drops containing rhinovirus, which is one of the viruses that causes a common cold. But in this case, zinc showed no benefit. However, this is an artificial situation which potentially exposes you to a higher amount of virus. An important parameter when evaluating something that has been taken as preventative is side effects, because no one wants to feel worse than they would if they actually caught the disease. The effects of side effects when zinc is used for prevention of RTIs is shown here. Generally, adverse events attributed to zinc treatment were minor and infrequent, and although they were numerically more common versus placebo, the difference wasn't statistically significant. So that's prevention, but what about if you've already got an RTI? Does zinc help you then? Well, that depends on how you define help, as there are lots of different ways to assess whether a treatment is working. So let's have a look at some ways it can be assessed and what they found. Firstly, they looked at the severity of symptoms at day three. And the reason they chose day three is because that's generally when acute symptoms are at their worst. So you can see that the diamond down the bottom of the forest plot is to the left, which means that overall zinc decreases the severity of symptoms at day three. But we can also see a lot of red dots, which means the quality of the evidence isn't great. And indeed, they assessed the certainty of this evidence as low, which means the true effect might be markedly different from the estimated effect. They also looked at duration of symptoms and found that on average, zinc reduced symptom duration by two days. Alas, the certainty of this evidence was assessed as very low quality, which means the true effect is probably markedly different from the estimated effect. So although it's possible that zinc might reduce the length of time that you suffer from symptoms, the evidence isn't good enough to really say so. 
They also found that if you didn't take zinc, you were more likely to remain symptomatic on day seven. But again, the evidence was low certainty. As a prevention, they also looked at side effects. The good news is that 25 trials monitored for serious adverse events and none were found. And that is why this figure only shows non-serious adverse events. In terms of these minor adverse events, they were more frequent in those that took zinc compared with those in the placebo groups. And these side effects included nausea or stomach discomfort. And for those who took their zinc in the form of lozenges, there was an increased incidence of mouth soreness or irritation. And some people also complained about the taste. So there is some evidence that zinc could be effective for preventing and treating RTIs, but particularly in terms of treatment, the evidence isn't very spectacular. But the important thing to note is that all the studies covered in the meta-analysis were in people who already had adequate levels of zinc. And that's because it would be completely unethical to include zinc deficient people in a randomised trial because you would be denying them treatment that would definitely benefit them. There is no question that zinc is essential for an effectively functioning immune system. And in fact, one of the signs of zinc deficiency is increased susceptibility to infections. In addition to helping the immune system, zinc performs a number of key functions in the body. It plays a role in cell division, cell growth, wound healing, and the breakdown of carbohydrates. Zinc is also needed for the senses of taste and smell, and it supports a person's growth and development, which means it is an essential mineral for pregnant women as well as growing children. A person's body does not store zinc, which means you need to get it regularly if you don't want to be deficient. So what are the signs that you could be zinc deficient? As I previously mentioned, increased infections could be a sign of zinc deficiency. It can also result in skin changes that look a bit like eczema, and this particularly occurs around the mouth and hands and doesn't get better with moisturisers or steroid creams. Other possible signs are hair loss, diarrhoea, problems with eyesight, taste or smell, poor appetite, lack of energy and impotence. Now, it's important to mention that these problems could have other causes, so you should see your medical practitioner for a proper diagnosis. So what foods are high in zinc? Well, most animal products are, and this makes sense because animals also need zinc. So you'd expect products that come from animals to contain zinc. And Julie here gets most of her zinc from animal products, and this is one of Julie's favorite animal products that contains zinc. But what if you don't eat meat? Well, if you eat seafood, that's also very high in zinc. In fact, one of the highest known sources of zinc are oysters. And it's the zinc content of oysters that are the reasons that they are known as aphrodisiacs. And I don't have any oysters handy to show you, but I do have some pearls which are made from oysters. Okay, so what if you are actually vegan? There are options for you too. Zinc is also present in nuts, grains, seeds, beans and legumes. And a particularly high source of zinc is baked beans. Another good source, believe it or not, is potatoes, both regular and sweet varieties. Now, it is important to know that zinc from some grains and legumes may be harder to absorb because they contain phytates, which bind to the zinc. But phytates can be reduced by soaking and cooking. The other way to ensure you get enough zinc is by taking supplements. And hey, your body can't tell the difference between zinc from food and zinc from a supplement. However, if you do choose to take a supplement, it's important to make sure that you don't take too much. If you take too much zinc, it can impair your body's ability to absorb other essential minerals like iron, copper and calcium and can also affect your heart function. The absolute maximum zinc that you should take daily is 40 milligrams. And it's important to remember that most multivitamins already contain zinc. This multivitamin, for example, contains five milligrams, which combined with what you'd already be getting in your diet would be enough for most people. So what about COVID? Will zinc help there? Well, the simple answer is we don't know. A number of trials have been registered, but most of them haven't published their results yet. However, I did find one trial that gives us some information. Let's have a look. The trial was published in JAMA Open Network, and they compared treating COVID sufferers with zinc, vitamin C, or a combination of both. And they also had an arm that just got the standard of care for comparison. 
It was also randomised, which means that people were randomly assigned to each group and the total number of patients was 234. What did they find? A big fat nothing. There was no difference between the groups in the primary endpoint, which was 50% reduction in symptom severity, and also no difference in any of the secondary endpoints. So this means that zinc didn't work by itself and didn't work in combination with vitamin C. Now, this study specifically looked at treatment, so it's possible that there is still a role for zinc in prevention of COVID, but at the moment we are still waiting on data. Although you definitely wouldn't want to get COVID if you were zinc deficient. One more thing that I would like to look at very briefly is using zinc in combination with hydroxychloroquine. Although hydroxychloroquine has been shown to have no benefit whatsoever for COVID, some people just won't let it die and claim that it just needs to be given with zinc to work. As it happens, this has also been looked at in a study. This is a study and it was published in a journal called Biological Trace Element Research. It involved just under 200 patients. Half the patients received hydroxychloroquine by itself and the other half received hydroxychloroquine combined with zinc. And there was no difference in the trial between the groups. So zinc doesn't help hydroxychloroquine. It still doesn't work. So in summary, zinc is an important element and you definitely want to make sure you are getting enough. There is some evidence that taking supplements could be beneficial in reducing the impact of colds and other RTIs, but the quality of the evidence isn't as good as it could be. Now, if you'd like to read the papers that I've discussed yourself, you'll find the links to them in the video's description. And please remember, this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. So thank you for listening. And if you'd like to see more videos in the future, please hit the subscribe button.